All right, this is the lecture for Friday, uh, March 30th, which is the last day before spring break. And I am sure that everybody is excited for spring break. I hope you have a great spring break. And um, also, I'd like to send out a, a big happy birthday to Taylor Muchow. Uh, I guess one day late. I guess yesterday was on Thursday, her birthday. So happy birthday, Taylor. And um, anyway, all right, so we are uh, moving on to page 13, actually, of your notes. And while I kind of adjust the camera here just a little bit, um, we're going to be going through uh, some really big concepts, actually. Um, so page 13 of your notes, go ahead and uh, find that. We're going to skip around, and I appreciate your um, patience as, as I kind of jump around and try to find uh, pieces of your notes that are going to be a little easier to do on uh, video as opposed to being there actually in person. So we're going to run through gravitational potential energy. Uh, some of you may be thinking, well, maybe maybe we've already done this. And to be honest with you, we actually have. Um, we have an old equation for gravitational potential energy. Uh, that was MGH. We've talked about that. Uh, but that act that equation actually is kind of a um, it's kind of a restrictive. Um, equation. It can't be used all the time. There are some restrictions to it. And so we're going to go through those restrictions today, introduce to you a new equation for gravitational potential energy, and then uh, run through the key concepts that are on page 14, do example number 8, and then uh, and then call it a wrap. So that's kind of the plan for today. Um, we're on, again, we're on page 13, and uh, we're going to go ahead and rock and roll and see what we can come up with. So the first thing I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take this area right up here at the top your top left-hand part of this open space, and we're going to kind of focus in a little bit on the old equation for gravitational potential energy. So let's go ahead and imagine this being um, the surface of the Earth. And when we used to do this equation, gravitational potential energy equals mgh, that equation um, worked really well for us. But as we start to pick up more concepts, develop more ideas, um, it's not it's not going to help us out as we move through the rest of this chapter. And we have to come up with a new equation for gravitational potential energy. But I want to do a quick review of this guy. So this one, we have to set a reference point. And remember when we set a reference point, usually we set the Earth. So, uh... We said the Earth was the reference point. And any time that we were on the Earth, we could say that the gravitational potential energy of that object um, was equal to zero. That's how we defined it. And to be honest with you, um, I'm not sure if you remember this, but we actually said that where we put that reference point was arbitrary. It didn't actually have to be on the ground. It could, be, could have been on the table. It could have been... Um, on top of a building, it could have been uh, in, a, in the bottom of a well. Um, it really didn't matter where the reference point was. It was completely arbitrary. But usually when we did it, it just made it easier to uh, put it right on the ground. So it was kind of a customary thing. And so the idea went like this. If I have an object, and that object was on the ground, then it had uh, zero gravitational potential energy because it was on the reference point. If I move the object up a little bit, uh, H would go up, and so with a gravitational potential energy. And that wasn't a big deal. I think you all caught on to that fairly quickly and uh, were able to work with it just fine. But like I said, this equation is uh, somewhat restrictive, and we need to go ahead and open it, open it up a little bit and uh, come up with a new equation. So uh, pretty much from here on out, I'm going to go ahead and spend some time introducing the new equation. I'll tell you what is at the, at the end of, of this little piece, and then... Um, then we'll work from there. So to be able to introduce the new equation, we need to come up with a couple new, um, more general ideas. So instead of restricting ourselves to this area right here, just immediately close to the Earth, uh, we need to go ahead and, and look a little bit bigger. So I'm going to kind of box this in. Okay, that's its own idea. And then the rest of this is going to be for the new equation. So um, we're going to put the Earth way out here. Uh, so there's the Earth, and i got to sneeze, so I'm going to hit my mute button. I think I have to sneeze. It's coming. It's still there. All right, so hopefully I hit the mute button. You didn't get a, an earful of sneeze. 
All right, so here's the Earth, and what we're going to do is this. We're going to go ahead and extend this. We're going to go all the way out to infinity. And uh, I know it's kind of weird to think about going out to infinity, but we're going to say that way out here, I know we can't really get there, but we're going to say way out here is going to be infinitely away. So I'm going to put the symbol for infinite uh, right here. So the distance between the Earth and this is going to be infinite. Okay, It's going to go all the way out there. And what we're going to do is this. On this particular equation, remember, we're, wherever we, we, the place where we put the reference point is completely arbitrary. But when we do this next one, we're going to not make the position of the reference point arbitrary. We're going to set it at a certain place and then leave it. And that's where it will always be for this next equation. And so we're going to say that the reference point is going to be at infinity. And if we say that the reference point is going to be at, fin at infinity, then automatically the gravitational potential energy, so I'll say this, G, P, E, the gravitational potential energy by definition is going to be zero right here. So I have the in infinite sign. I'm going to come around like this, and I'm going to put zero joules of gravitational potential energy. Out, at, out there is going to be no potential energy. Now that's a little different and that's going to give us some uh, fits as we start to work through some of these new concepts. Alright, so uh, what we're going to do first is just kind of look at s kind of a range right in here and we're going to let an object uh, just basically I'm just going to kind of just let it, just kind of let it go, put an object right here and just let it go. Well if I let it go uh, we know it has mass, we know the Earth has mass and so the Earth is going to tug on it. And so this will be the gravitational force of the Earth pulling on that object. And so this is the force. And the object is going to move this way. So I'll go ahead and uh, show that with um, the word distance, or we could say movement. So if you look at this, the force and the movement are in the same direction. Now we've talked about force and movement before. And when we talk about force and movement, we want to uh, introduce that concept or reintroduce that concept of work. And remember that work was going to be F dot D. And we know that work then is equal to um, a dot product is going to be F D cosine theta. And check this out. Do you remember doing this? I'm not, I'm not here right now. So um, in the classroom with you. Um, so you don't have to actually do this one. So I know some of you uh, are going to be excited about this. But remember when these two are pointing the same direction, remember the airplane pilot types bringing the plane in and they're waving the flags and well, those both arms are pointing in the same direction. So the angle there is zero and cosine of, of, of zero actually gives you one. So this actually gives you a positive value. So the work done here is positive. And if the work done is positive, then we can say that the object is speeding up. And that's real important. And it kind of makes sense. If you let go of an object and it falls to the ground, it's going to speed up. This is just a fancy way of saying that when you, let, when you drop objects, they speed up. That's all it means. All right, now we're going to go on the other side of this. And we're going to say this. We're going to say, we're going to take an object, throw it, and then let it go. So when we let it go, it's already going to be in motion. Here, it was at rest. Here, it's going to be in motion. Well, what is it going to do? It's going to travel a little while. And as it does that, it's going to slow down on the way up. We're going to show why it actually slows down. So this is going to be the movement. Um, or we can think of distance. All right, and we know that as it moves, the force acting on it is going to be this way. The gravity is actually, the Earth is still pulling on it to the left. So the f direction of the force up here and the direction of the force down here has not changed. It's still, they are still in the same direction. But now look what happens here. Up here, the force and distance are pulling, are, are, mo are directed in the same direction. Here, they're in opposite directions. So when I take a look at work, work being a dot product, so work equals 
f dot d um, and work is equal to f d cosine theta. Now they're in opposite directions, which means this gives us uh, a th an angle of 180 degrees. One arm is pointed in one direction, one arm is pointed in the other direction, gives us 180 degrees, which means the work done is not zero, but the work done is negative. Even if the work done is negative, that causes the object to slow down. And that is really, really, really important. All right, so what have we done so far? We've said that if you let go of an object, uh, it's going to accelerate towards the earth, it'll speed up, the work done on it is positive, and there it is, it's speeding up. If you throw an object, it's going to slow down on the way up, or on the way out, and it slows down because the motion and the force are moving in opposite directions, or acting in opposite directions, which gives you, makes the work negative, which causes it to slow down. Okay, now I want to take a look at what's going on with uh, the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is not too difficult to think about. You're going to catch on to this fairly quickly. But it's when we talk, start talking about gravitational potential energy, that's when it gets a little sticky. So let's talk about this part right here. As the object moves closer to the Earth, um, it speeds up. If it speeds up, its kinetic energy is going to rise. Speeds up. And that makes sense. Kinetic energy rises because it speeds up. In this case, as you throw it out, it's going to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, eventually come to rest. But as it slows down, its kinetic energy is going to decrease. All right, now let's talk about gravitational potential energy because this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. The old, equa the old abbreviation for gravitational potential energy was MGH, I'm sorry, GPE, gravitational potential energy. But we're going to kind of introduce a new one. And I think I have talked about it briefly. And we're going to call gravitational potential energy UG. And so we're going to look at it in two different cases. And so here's the concept behind this. The gravitational potential energy at infinity is zero. That's the way we defined it. Now, think about this. If we go beyond infinity, which I know we can't do, but if we go beyond infinity, then what we're going to say is then way out here, beyond infinity, gravitational potential energy is going to be greater than zero, which is positive. Now, I know we can't get out there, but we have to understand that idea that anything beyond infinity, there's a cartoon character. Is it beyond infinity? No, I can't even remember it. I'm sure you guys will be shouting it out in class. There's a cartoon character. My nephew, Braden, loves to talk about beyond, go beyond infinity. I don't know what it is. I'm sure you guys are laughing at me right now. All right, so beyond infinity is uh, the gravitational potential energy is positive. So I'll put positive here. And so if, if the gravitational potential energy at infinity is zero, beyond infinity is positive, then anything over here to the left of infinity is negative. So the gravitational potential energy to the left of infinity or to the side that the Earth is on, remember the Earth sits over here, is going to be negative. So let's think about this. What happens to an object if it is at infinity, you let it go, and it starts to move this way? Well, its gravitational potential energy goes from zero. We have that. So it goes from zero joules at infinity to negative 1 joules, to negative 2 joules. I'm just making these numbers up. Negative 3 joules. If it goes from 0 to negative 1 to negative 2 to negative 3, what's happening to its gravitational potential energy? Well, it's becoming more negative. But as it becomes more negative, its value becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's the part that's really tough to think about. So as we move this way, let me open this up just a little bit. As we move this way, as we move away from infinity, the gravitational potential energy actually becomes a little bit smaller. And so what we're going to say is the gravitational potential energy decreases. So look at what I've got. As I move to the left, the kinetic energy goes up because I speed up, and the gravitational potential energy goes down because I get further and further and further away from the infinite mark or the gravitational or the reference point which is where gravitational potential energy is zero 
All right, now everything is reverse when you are moving towards infinity. If you're moving towards infinity, you'll be at negative 3 joules, negative 2 joules, negative 1 joules, and eventually 0. Well, if you're 0 way out here, then your gravitational potential, you're getting closer and closer and closer to 0, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. That means your gravitational potential and energy is slowly going up. I know that sounds weird. But remember on a number line, if this is 0, and this is 1, and this is 2, and this is negative 1, and negative 2, as you move this way to the right on a number line, your value gets bigger. How about I count correctly? Let's put a 1 right here. Your value gets bigger. Well, there's no different down here. As you move closer and closer to 0, your value gets bigger. So the gravitational potential energy gets goes up. All right, now, I want to put all of this together. I'm going to pick up the law of conservation of energy and see if we can tie it together and give you a new equation. All right, so I'm going to say E0 equals EF. All right, so we have to find where E0 is. Where's the beginning? We're going to start the object way down here. And we're going to throw it fast enough that that ball is going to get all it's going to go all the way out to its reference point and then stop. So the initial position is down by the earth. The final position is all the way out. I'll put final here. The final position is all the way out to infinity. Now, not your normal average run of the mill person is going to be able to throw it out to infinity. So if you want to do this, you're going to have to find a cardinal fan. And a cardinal fan will have no problem throwing the object uh, off the earth and getting it all the way out to infinity. Um, Cub fans will have no chance at all to make that happen. But let's go ahead and run the run the equation and see if we can make some sense of this. So at the we're going to actually to make sense of this, we're going to start at infinity. So we're going to start at the final position because the numbers become very easy out there. All right. So what is your gravitational potential energy out here? At infinity, we have no gravitational potential energy. That's the way we defined it. That's where we put the reference point. Well, if I throw it in such a way, if I throw it just fast enough so that when it gets to infinity, its kinetic energy is zero, that means it'll be at rest. So we can say at the end, the kinetic energy is zero and the gravitational potential energy is zero. Well, I'm going to come back over here. At the beginning, I throw it very hard. So I do have kinetic energy. It is not zero. I'll put a little over here because this is at the beginning. Plus some gravitational potential energy. I will have gravitational potential energy at the beginning. And I'll have gravitational potential energy at the beginning because I am not at the reference point. If I were at the reference point, I'd have zero gravitational potential energy. All right. Now, we know what the equation for kinetic energy is. The equation for kinetic energy is the one that we've always had. It's 1 half mv squared. I need to add it to the, gravita the gravitational potential energy, but I can't use this equation. This equation is actually illegal now once I start, once I start in on this equation. And so the new equation that we're going to have for gravitational potential energy looks like this. U equals negative g, you know what that is, m m over d. And I want to talk a little bit about this. I first want to justify its units. So the units for g, if you don't remember, are newton meter squared over kilogram squared. There's your kilograms there for meters. Or for, so for mass is kilograms. And we're going to divide by the mass. Let's see if I can focus that a little bit for you guys. Does that feel better? All right, so if you look at this, I have a meter cancel with the meter down here. I still have a meter left up here. The kilogram squared on the bottom cancels the kilogram squared on the bottom down there. And I'm left then with a newton meter. And a newton meter, if you remember, is a joule. And a joule should measure energy. So actually, the units work out just fine. OK, so the units work out. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is this negative. Why is the gravitational potential energy in this particular equation negative? Well, it all goes back to how we defined where the reference point is. The reference point we said was all the way out infinity. Anything beyond infinity 
is going to be uh, positive. Anything on this side of infinity is going to be negative. So since we can't get beyond infinity, and we can't really get to infinity, then the gravitational potential energy is defined as negative. That's why this guy is negative. And so if I come down here, I can insert this equation here. So I got G M M all over D. This is the mass of one object. This is the mass of the other object. And this is the distance between them squared. And then I will have G. So for right now, you kind of have two ideas. You got this one, and you got this guy. All right, I'm going to talk about one more thing. I'm going to go backwards. Let's go back to this equation, talk about why we can't use this equation and why this equation is a bit restrictive. This equation assumes that G right here will always be 9.8, or it will always be a number that never changes. Well, as long as we're near the surface of Earth, the acceleration of gravity, unless you're out by the northern press booth, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Even if I go up to the top of a tall building, this number is still going to basi basically be 9.8. Even if I go to the top of a high mountain, this number is basically still 9.8. So it doesn't change. But when I go to this example and I get really far from Earth, that acceleration of gravity doesn't stay 9.8. It changes. And if it changes, then this equation cannot be used because this number, as I move further and further and further away from the Earth, gets it, it actually changes. It actually goes down. And if it changes, then the only way I can come up with a new equation is to account for its changing characteristic. And the only way I can account for that changing characteristic is to use any use a. Um, a a branch of mathematics that allows us to uh, deal with changes. And that branch of mathematics that allows us to deal with changes is calculus. And so if you're wondering where in the world did this equation come from, it actually came from, comes from a little bit of calculus. Those that knew, know some calc, you had to, do, you had to take it actually an integral as you moved away uh, from the Earth. We're not interested in you being able to do that or even talk about it, but I just want to throw it out there. All right, so we have an, this equation, which is the, the very, very important equation. We're going to take this equation and answer the questions on the next page. So flip the, flip the page over. We're going to page 14. I'm going to run through the key concepts with you and uh, wrap up this session. So here are the key concepts, uh, which basically all apply to this equation. So d u equals negative g m m over d squared. And so here they go. All right, work is positive. Work is positive when the force and displacement act in the same direction. And the force causes the object to speed up. This is all, all from the previous page. So we've already talked about all of this information. See if I can get this in the correct blank there. So there's up. All right. Work is negative when the force and displacement act in not the same direction, but opposite directions. And the force causes the object to slow down. All right. Moving along. The abbreviation for gravitational potential energy, the new, new abbreviation is UG. When we calculated the gravitational potential energy in chapter 6 with the equation GPE equals MGH, the location of the reference point was arbitrary. I don't think there's an R in there. You guys can correct my spelling. I am sure of that. So it's arbitrary. When we calculate the gravitational potential energy in the equation uh, ne U equals negative GMM over D, the reference point is not arbitrary. Matter of fact, there's arbitrary, and did I get it correct? Hey, hey, miracles do occur. I got it spelled correctly. All right, the next one, D or R in the distance, is, is, is the distance between the centers of the two objects. So this D, sometimes you'll see it as an R, and that's not a big deal. The zero reference point, where U equals zero, is at infinity. Because gravity has an infinite range. 
the closer to Earth, so as we get closer and closer to the Earth, the more negative U becomes, and the smaller the value corresponding to a lower, uh, lower position in a potential energy well. What does that mean? Well, as you, as you move this way, you go from 0 to negative 1 to negative 2 to negative 3. You get, you get smaller and smaller and smaller negative numbers, which means the value becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, which means you kind of get further and further and further into a, like, a, like a potential energy well. It takes a lot of work then to pull you out of that well. All right, the next piece. The further from Earth... Um, the less negative U becomes and the bigger the value corresponding to a higher position in a potential energy well. Alright, if you need some help with that, I can take some questions on those last two bullet points when I, when I return. Alright, the last bit, we're going to tackle example number eight and then we'll, we'll be done. You're doing a great job. All right, so we want to calculate the gravitational potential energy of an astronaut in orbit. So the equation for gravitational potential energy is U equals negative G M M over D. Notice that this D does not have a D squared on it. So um, that's going to be important in, a next, in an upcoming bullet point. So we're going to go ahead and plug numbers in. So we got negative. We know uh, G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. And we know G because Cavendish figured it out. It was one thing that Newton wasn't able to do. This is the mass of the astronaut, and the other M is the mass of the Earth. Well, the mass of a typical astronaut, if you have all his gear, is probably at least 100 kilograms. The mass of the Earth, we calculated that the other day. And that's going to be 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Let you mentally catch up. And then we have to divide by this distance. Now remember, this is the distance between the centers. Now I've got to be careful on this. If I draw a diagram, what is that distance going to be? I've got an astronaut way out here in orbit, so that's this distance right here. Well, how do I get that distance? That's the distance of the radius, so the radius plus how high he is above the, above the surface of the Earth. Well, we've done that before. If we actually go back... I gotta sneeze again. I think. Maybe. Hopefully I hit the mute button there. Alright, so I gotta go back a few pages. And so if I go back um, to page 11, I'll give you a, ch a second to, um, to go back to this, we actually calculated uh, the distance between the uh, center of the Earth and the uh, and, and, and the center of the space shuttle when it's in orbit. And that number was right there. It was 6749873 meters. That's the distance between the centers. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer that number to my equation. That number is this guy. That's the whole, whole thing. And so if I transfer it, it's going to be 6749873. 73 meters. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and plug um, that into my calculator. It's going to take me a moment to grab my calculator. Uh, and I brought it to Rock Valley last night, so I got to dig in the bag to go get it. I have found it. And we're going to take this guy, plug it right here, and uh, see if we can zoom in on it, work this calculation, and then we'll be close to being done. And you'll be that much closer to a spring break. And uh, I am actually, my spring break has started yesterday. So you guys are in school while I am on spring break. I know you guys are thrilled about that. All right, so we're going to take uh, G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Multiply it times 100. Multiply it times the mass of the Earth. And then, uh, then divide it by... It uh, looks like 6,749,873 meters. So 6749873. Did I get that in right? Yep, I think so. 
And so we'll go ahead and hit equals. And there's the number that I get. That's the number of joules that uh, this particular individual will have, or this astronaut will have, when it's out in space. This is his gravitational potential energy. So it'll be negative 59290004422 joules. Scientific notation 5.9 times 10. And uh, how many zeros do I got? Looks like I'll have nine zeros, joules. And I got to remember, I got it. I got to make that negative. I got to make a negative because we're on this side of the reference level. All right, last little bit, and we're done. And then your spring break starts real soon. So when the orbit of an astronaut increases, U becomes. It becomes. Uh, let's see now. Let's think about this. As the orbit of an astronaut increases, that means we get further and further and further and further out. So that means distance, the distance actually goes up, which means this number becomes, um, let's say it was like negative 10, it becomes uh, like negative 9, then negative 8, then negative 7, then negative 6. Okay, so it actually, the number actually becomes bigger. But be, but in the, in terms of this blank, it becomes a smaller or a, yes, I guess we we'll use the word smaller, a smaller negative. So the number actually becomes the number actually becomes a smaller and smaller negative, which means u actually increases, and it increases because I get closer and closer to zero. If the orbit of astronaut is reduced by half, so I so in my equation negative g m m over d. If I reduce it by half, that means I get half as far away. You will actually, um, I got to think this through myself. So this really becomes negative 2 times g m m over d. So it actually becomes twice as much. If the orbit, orbit of an astronaut is tripled, that means we're going to put a 3 down here. That means we're dividing by 3. So it becomes one third as much. And then the last part is last quest, last question: Is this an example of the inverse square law? And the answer is no. And the the reason for it, to have the inverse square law, I got to have d squared in the denominator. And now that I'm thinking back on this, I have a feeling I may have made a mistake on these two bullet points. I will circle those, and when we come back from break, uh, we'll sharpen those up, make sure I don't have mistakes. We'll use that as a re, as a review when we come back next Tuesday. And that's that. So have yourselves a great, great, great spring break, and uh, we will see you in a couple weeks.